Well, today we close out our timeless teachings uh, series where we've been going through parables of Jesus. So I hope as we've gone through this series, you've spent time with Jesus and you've been listening to what he's said about the king, the kingdom, our role within the kingdom, and so many other amazing things that just help shape and mold us as followers of Jesus. Well, today we're going to close out with actually two parables. But these two parables are found in only three verses in total. But we get to experience the depth of God's word in just those three verses as we learn more about the kingdom of God. I believe the message is not only for those that already belong to the kingdom of God, but also for those of you maybe that are searching or seeking and feel like you're on the outside trying to figure out what this kingdom of God really looks like. So would you stand with me out of respect for God's word as we read from Matthew chapter 13 verses 44 through 46 and it's the parables of the hidden treasure and the pearl. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. This is God's word for God's people. Let's pray. Father, help open our eyes to the kingdom. May we recognize that you have invited us in. May we receive that invitation and live in your kingdom forever. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to go through these three verses, these two parables here this morning. And on the screen, we're going to have both of them up at the same time. And we're going to look at some of the similarities and differences between the two parables. You see, they go together. They have a parallel meaning, but there are slight nuances that we can learn a lot from. So we read in that second parable, it opens up with the word again. So we know that Jesus is tying them together for us. So let's jump in. In the first parable, we see this idea of treasure. Now, if I were to ask you just to imagine what treasure is, because it's not specific in this parable, if you were to close your eyes, you would probably imagine something, maybe gold or silver or diamonds or just something in your mind of great value and worth. We see in the second parable, this idea of fine pearls. Well, that's what pearls were. They were of great value. They were worth so much at this time period, just like gold or silver or diamonds. It truly was this priceless treasure that if you had a pearl, you had a lot. And so we see that Jesus is telling us in these parables that there is something of incredible value, of incredible worth, something that is literally priceless. And what Jesus is describing for you and I is the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of God. It's the king of the kingdom. Jesus Christ himself that is literally priceless. Now, when we try to put a definition on the kingdom of God, let's be honest, it's kind of hard, isn't it? It'd be kind of like me asking you to define God himself. There's so many characteristics and attributes that we can't put God in a box. He's so much greater. He's so much bigger than you and I could ever imagine. And that's true with the kingdom of God as well. We see some descriptions of the kingdom of God being God's reign over everything, the the heavens and the earth. We look at it sometimes as being the reign over men and women's, their hearts, the spiritual kingdom. The kingdom that Jesus brought when he came the first time and the kingdom that he'll make complete and whole when he comes again the second time. There's many kind of different aspects and views of the kingdom, but what I think we need to understand is we can't put the kingdom of God in a box. It's so much bigger, so much more than what we could ever conceive. But what's important is that Jesus is telling us is that that kingdom of God That kingdom is priceless. Let's look at these words here, hidden and looking. We see in the first parable that this treasure is hidden. That means that people hadn't noticed it yet. 
It had been out in the field. This man wasn't the first person to go into this field. There had been others that probably were walking through it, working in it. And even though that it was present and it was there, so many people had missed what was right in front of them. But here this man, he, he kind of stumbles upon the treasure, doesn't he? And in some ways, that's how God reveals the kingdom to you and I at times. Maybe that's part of your story. Maybe that's part of you today looking and searching because God has shown up when you weren't looking for him. Think about the woman at the well. She went to the well not looking for Jesus in the kingdom. She went looking for water and look what she found. She found the kingdom of God, the good news. Saul was on the road to Damascus. He was going to persecute the kingdom. He wasn't looking for Jesus and the good news. And Jesus shows up out of nowhere and reveals himself to Saul. And Paul receives the kingdom and the good news. I was talking with a friend of mine that was here just last week and him and his wife had went to this Christian concert up in Kansas City and they noticed that the person sitting next to them had come alone. And so they struck up conversation with this uh, young lady and, and began asking questions. And what they discovered, what they found was she revealed to them, she said, I've been living outside the kingdom. I've been living a way of life that God doesn't want me to. But one day I, I just heard this voice that said, you need to leave this life. And she said, I knew it was the voice of God. I knew it had to be the voice of God. I recognized it out of nowhere and I got up and I left my old life. Maybe that's your story that God showed up in a way when you were least expecting it. You weren't looking for him, but there he is. And he opens your eyes to the kingdom. In the second one, we see this idea of looking. See, this person was looking for fine pearls. Looking for pearls isn't just walking around like kicking things going, oh, is it there? Nope, nope, is it there? No, looking for pearls, you had to be all in and committed to find a pearl. They didn't have scuba gear and technology and cameras to go looking for pearls back then. What they did was they would get a big rock and tie a rope to it. And then they would either tie the other end of the rope to themselves or hold on to it as they pushed the rock into the water. And it sank down to the bottom so then they could go down with it and look for the pearls. I don't know about you, but I don't want to do that. But it was that full commitment to looking for something that they desired. They were searching and seeking. And maybe that's your story. Maybe that's part of your testimony or maybe that's part of where you're at today that you know that there's something out there and you've been searching and seeking for it. Look at Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. It's not just this half in kind of kicking the rocks over looking for God, are you there? God tells us that when we seek him with all of our heart, that, that full commitment of wanting to know him, spending time with him, looking in his word, praying, when we seek him with all of our heart, he tells us that you and I will find him. But it's a committed search on your part and mine. We see that whether it just appeared, whether it came out of nowhere and kind of caught off guard or whether it was being looked for and sought after, we see that both individuals find it. My question for us today is, how do we recognize it? How do we know that we've found the treasure? How do we know that we've found the pearls? I remember when I used to be in banking and so many times the tellers, you know, they're dealing in cash and transactions. It wasn't uncommon for them to take counterfeit currency, for someone to bring something in that was a fake. Now, some of the tellers right off the bat from the very beginning never missed the real thing. From the moment they walked in, they knew the difference between the fake and the real currency. 
But for many, many of the tellers, they didn't recognize the real thing until they had experienced the counterfeit. Isn't that true for you and I? And so many times we go through this life and we experience all these kind of kingdoms of the world and we have to go through the brokenness and the darkness and realize just how messed up they are and how they don't fulfill us and and give us what we need. And we have to experience that so that when the real thing comes, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, we go, I've never seen it before, but that has to be the real thing because it's so much different than anything I've ever experienced. That's the real deal, and I want that. Sometimes we we recognize the real thing because we can compare it. We compare it back and forth and just think for a second. Think about the ways of the world and the kingdoms of this world and what they say compared to the kingdom of God. The kingdoms of this world, the kingdoms of this world say you and I are the king, that you and I sit on the throne. The kingdom of God says Jesus is the king. The kingdoms of this world say that you have to earn the love of others. You have to earn the love of God. And in the kingdom of God, it's full of unconditional love. The world says that when you're wronged, you should go get revenge. You should make things right. But the kingdom of God says, forgive them, love and pray for your enemies. The world's full of anger and chaos. But the kingdom of God is a kingdom of peace. You see, when we start thinking about it and comparing the things of this world to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God starts to become very obvious, doesn't it? Jesus in the kingdom of God is like nothing else this world has. We recognize it. We recognize it in your life and mine because it is so much different than anything else. We see here the word joy and in the second one, one of great value. And we'll get to that second part. But here what we see is this idea of these individuals being led either by their head or their heart. You've probably heard that before when maybe somebody has told you or you've thought about how you process things or how you're led. A lot of times we say you're led with your heart or you're led with your head. This man in the first parable, he experiences the kingdom of God. He, he finds the treasure. He finds something so different than anything else he's ever experienced. And he's filled with joy. He's filled with this emotion with inside of him. And he is driven by his heart. And the second one, this man was searching and seeking. He knew he was looking for something. He knew he was processing there has to be something out there, something different. And then he finds it. He finds his pearl. And when he sees and recognizes that it's of great value, it makes sense to him. He had found what he had been looking for. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're led with your heart or led with your head. What matters is that it causes you to move forward. It causes you to act with your hands and that an action comes from that leading. And so I encourage you today, if you find yourself in that place and you're experiencing the joy of the Lord, you're, you're experiencing that and you're being led by your heart, but it just doesn't seem to quite make sense. That's okay. Jesus is telling you, take this step forward, receive him, come into the kingdom. And then as you spend time with him, he'll help you understand. He'll help your mind come along. And the true is, is op- or the opposite is true too. That if today you're, you're searching and seeking and you're going, man, this kingdom of God, the, the things that are being preached and taught, it makes sense. 
It makes sense what they're saying. It makes sense what Jesus is trying to get to us, but I'm just not feeling some of the things that everyone else seems to feel. Jesus is telling you to take that step forward, to come into the kingdom. And as you spend time with Jesus, let him work on your heart. Let him bring along that emotion and that feeling. None of us are only head people or only heart people, but it's true that sometimes we're led that way. God has created us that way. It's okay to embrace that and be led in that direction and then let God work on us as a whole. But the key is however you're processing it, however it's coming together for it to lead you to action. Both of these individuals, they were led to action. They were led to action. It says that they sold everything they had and bought it. Now, I want to be very clear here. They did not buy salvation. They did not buy the kingdom. They did not buy eternity. We know that salvation is a gift from God. It can't be earned. It can't be bought. It is literally a gift from God that we choose to receive in faith by believing that Jesus is who he says he is, that he's the savior of the world. But what Jesus is saying, because this parable, he he was talking to his disciples at this time uh, with with this parable and what he's explaining to them and, and what should resonate with you and I is that once we experience Jesus, once we have found him, once we have found the kingdom, we're willing to give up everything to be a part of it and to belong. Salvation is free, but discipleship, following Jesus, it does cost us everything. We have to let go of everything. We, we surrender our will for God's will and let go of everything of this world so that we can be a part of the kingdom of God. Look at this, Matthew 16, 26. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? We have to let go of the things of this world We have to release them because they do not last, but the kingdom of God lasts forever. And so Jesus is saying, when you find me, let go of everything else that you are a part of. Let go of everything that you have. Let go of everything and be a part of my kingdom, choosing to follow me with everything you have. And when you find Jesus... When you find the kingdom, I hope you realize the search is over. You don't have to look any further. You don't have to keep looking for for fulfillment, excuse me. You don't have to keep looking and searching because you have found everything you need in Jesus and in the kingdom. Jesus told these parables so he could connect stories with a greater meaning. He took stories that were part of the culture, things that were easy for them to relate to and understand. I want to take for just a second a kind of an idea or an example from our culture that I think will help us even understand the kingdom of God today. Now, when I put it up there, I know some of you are going to cheer and some of you are going to boo. You can get it out right away, okay? We're a, we're a culture of sports, and so here's the example. If you're struggling with the team, replace it with a different one in your head. But here's the thing. When we think about this idea of a chief's kingdom, let's be honest. Right now, you would look at it, and you'd say, man, it's, it's thriving. There's energy. There's excitement. There's things going on. Well, I think there's a few reasons for that that can help us today. Think about this. The first thing is that there's a clear leader of the kingdom. Everyone knows this person. It doesn't matter whether you're young or you're old, whether you're male or female. You all know 
Taylor Swift. <laughs> Sorry to break it to you, Swifties. Pastor Aaron told me she's not the leader of the kingdom. It's Patrick Mahomes, right? Everyone knows Patrick Mahomes. They show up just to listen and to watch him every Sunday. They want to see what he's going to do. They want to see what he's going to say. But they don't just listen and watch him on Sundays, do they? All throughout the week, they're following him on social media or listening to news or whatever it might be because they they want to hear what the leader has to say. Think about the following. We had some cheers in here, but there's, there's this following, right, of people wearing the team jersey, being a part of something bigger, being a part of something that through the different seasons, the ups and downs, the highs and lows, they're united. They're part of this community that encourages one another and strengthens one another. And really, they're open to anyone being a part of the kingdom, but it is your choice. Let's think about this aspect as well, is that right now, whether you like it or not, the kingdom is winning. It's been pretty successful. And when you win, that is part of the energy that comes into a kingdom, living in that victory. If a kingdom isn't winning, the kingdom isn't going to stand or last very long, is it? So we see some of these ideas that that help us understand the kingdom of God in some ways too, don't we? I would ask you the question, do you know who the leader of the kingdom of God is? Do you really know him? It's Jesus Christ, isn't it? Are you showing up though just on Sundays to hear and see what he's going to do? Or what about the rest of the week? Monday through Saturday, are you hanging on every word? Are you spending time in the Bible? Are you spending time in prayer because you just want to know what the leader of the kingdom has to say? You're drawn, you're connected. You want to hear his voice. Are you wearing the kingdom jersey? You're not made to go through life alone. Back to the ideas of the world that want to isolate you and draw you apart. That's not the kingdom of God. God says we're supposed to come together like this and belong to a greater kingdom. We're supposed to be there to encourage one another, strengthen one another, help each other from season to season. The world wants to drive you away and and isolate you as you deal with things like the depression, the anxiety, the marriage problems, the fear, the worry. There's so many things that you and I go through in this world and the world wants to separate you and say, it's not for here. You need to go over here. The kingdom of God says, bring it into the kingdom where we can talk about it and help each other and work through it. This is the place for it. Are you a part of the kingdom? Are you all in? Parts of the kingdom we're made to receive. There's times where we need that help. We need that support. But there's other times that being a part of the kingdom means giving back giving back into the kingdom to help support one another, to help encourage one another, to strengthen one another, to give our finances, to give our time. It's both. It's a place where we can come together and receive amazing gifts from God. And we can use the gifts that God's given us to pour back into the kingdom. But we're supposed to do it together. Think about winning. Do you live in victory in the kingdom of God? Not just a future victory, but today, do you live in the kingdom of God in victory? You know, I think a lot of times we think that the kingdom is in trouble. You see, we we live in a way that we've got one foot in the kingdom of God and one foot in the kingdoms of this world. And because we spend time in all these other places, When they start to fall apart, 
when they start to spin out of control, when they become chaotic, guess what? We think, well, we know that they're in trouble and we lay that onto the kingdom of God and think that the kingdom of God is in trouble. I need you to hear me that the kingdom of God is not in trouble. The kingdom of God has never been in trouble and it never will be in trouble. Jesus is on the throne. He's already claimed victory. The kingdom is not in trouble. Of course, all the other kingdoms are because Jesus isn't the cornerstone of those kingdoms. He's only the cornerstone in the kingdom of God. So these other kingdoms that we find ourselves in, whether it be financial or the economy or political kingdoms or religious kingdoms or whatever they are, of course they're falling apart. Of course they're going to break because they're not going to last. The only thing that lasts is the kingdom of God. Doesn't mean that you and I still can't be involved in those places or those areas of life. You and I belong to the kingdom of light, so we should work to drive back the kingdom of darkness in those areas. But it means that you and I should have both feet in the kingdom of God firmly planted so that we can look out at the things of this world and have the right perspective so that we can have this kingdom worldview that is so important for you and I. Because when we look through the kingdom lens, everything changes. Even though all these other things are spinning out of control and will continue to spin out of control and continue to get worse, the kingdom of God is not in trouble. So if you're in the kingdom of God, you're not in trouble either. We have to live in victory. Keeping with the kind of football analogy, here here in a week or two, the season kicks off. And if you were to miss the first game, but you recorded it and you were gonna go back and watch it later, and I told you before you watched it, hey, your team's gonna win by three. When you sit down to watch that and everything seems to be going wrong in that game, the injuries, the penalties, All these different things are happening. Normally, you'd be struggling to watch it. You'd be filled with this tension, right? You don't know what's going to happen. But all of a sudden, because I let you know that your team wins, you look at that game completely different. You look at it completely different. You don't get worked up. You don't become anxious or nervous because you know how it plays out. That's what you and I have to realize living in the kingdom. When we have both feet in the kingdom and have the right kingdom mindset in the kingdom view, we know how it plays out, don't we? We know how things are going to go. So when persecution comes our way, we expected it. We knew that it was going to happen. We knew that there would be bumps and trials and heartaches and all of these other things, but we know in the end that there is victory. And so we don't have to live in fear or worry or anger or in all of these other ways that sometimes we struggle with. We need to be a people. We need to be a people who want to hear the voice of the king more than any other voice and that we're seeking after his voice. We're spending time with him and getting to know him. We need to be a people who come together, that we we don't try to do life on our own, but we come together and have real authentic community, just the way the kingdom is set up for. And we need to live in victory each and every day, being reminded of how things are going to play out and not be surprised when the world is crumbling around us because the safety and security comes from within the kingdom. So one of the questions I have is, are you a part of the kingdom? If you're not sure, if you're on the outside, I want you to know you're a part of the kingdom by choosing to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe today that's what you need to do is you need to make that decision to trust Jesus. 
If that's you today, I want to encourage you to go out to Starting Point and talk with one of our volunteers about what that means for you in the kingdom. Join the kingdom. There's energy. There's a movement. Things are happening in in the kingdom. God is doing a work all around us and he wants you to be a part of it. He opened the door to his kingdom because of a love for you. So while the world may say you're, you don't fit or you're unlovable or you're not welcome here and not part of this, Jesus says to each and every one of us, I want you here. I want you a part of my kingdom. You belong. The kingdom of God is where each and every one of us find our belonging. We find our fulfillment. We find our joy in being with the Lord and being with one another. Today, we're going to close out. We're going to close out by listening to Jesus. Jesus taught us to pray, didn't he? In Matthew chapter 6, we we have what's known as the Lord's Prayer. We're going to say that together today because it's a kingdom prayer. Jesus gave us a kingdom-minded prayer. And in that prayer, there's many things that we've talked about during this series. I hope as you say it, you'll realize that you're uniting together. You're wearing that kingdom jersey with the people around you. And for those of you at home, online, or wherever you are, we want you to join in. We're going to have the words on the screen, so maybe you're newer to the kingdom. Maybe you've never heard this prayer before. Well, it's scripture. So we're going to put it up there and we're going to read it together because I want everyone to be a part of this. One voice, one body coming together with a kingdom-minded prayer to the king. So would you stand and let's pray this together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, the kingdom is not in trouble. You belong to the king and you are a part of the kingdom. Seek after the voice of the king. Be a part of the kingdom community. Live in victory, but take the good news of the kingdom with you. Because once you experience Jesus, once you experience the kingdom, you can't keep it to yourself, can you? Take it with you this week and share the good news of the kingdom with someone. Maybe it's a group of people, but share the kingdom news and then bring them back with you next week to be a part of the kingdom to be a part of what God is doing. And next week, we'll begin a new series where we begin to look at what it means to be a kingdom-minded family. God loves you. Receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his strength, and his joy, knowing that you belong to the king and the greatest kingdom. Amen.